Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matthew McLean, and I'm the acting CEO of Suicide Prevention Australia. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today. Let me first acknowledge the traditional owners on whose country we're meeting right across Australia, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. How lucky we are as a sector and indeed as a community to benefit from the wisdom, knowledge and insight that comes from 60,000 continuous years on this land. Today, of course, marks National Sorry Day. Important as ever to make that acknowledgement. I'd also like to acknowledge all of those with lived and living experience of suicide. Recognising not only the suffering that suicide brings when it touches our lives, but the courage of those who share their lived experience so that we can do better. You'll hear a lot of data today. It's an important part of policy and storytelling, but it doesn't tell all of the story. We recognise that behind every statistic lay a person in distress or a life lost and a cascade of grief amongst family, friends, workplaces and communities. We use this data to do better, to improve suicide prevention and to save lives. One of the most common things we hear from our members is the need for data in what we do. More of it, more timely and more often. Many of you joined us earlier this year for the launch of our national policy platform. One of the four key pillars of that platform is reliable data, timely and evidence. When we surveyed our sector last year, 96% of respondents agreed they need data to do what they do in suicide prevention. Yet only 23%, less than one in four, agreed they had access to the data they need right now. There's much to be done to address this and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare is helping with an important piece of this puzzle. With the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, AIHW, we're pleased today to launch our new data in practice series, where we'll take a deep dive into the suicide and self-harm monitoring system. This new national system is the most comprehensive collection of data for deaths by suicide, as well as self-harm and suicidal behaviours. It's designed to improve the quality, accessibility and timeliness of data on suicide and self-harm, and to support policymakers, researchers and practitioners drive better outcomes. This is the first in the series, and it will focus on suicide mortality data sets and how this data can support better practice. Future webinars will look more closely at hospital and ambulance data, as well as a range of modelling and research available through the system. We'll begin in a moment, but before we do, just a few housekeeping notes. Please ask any questions you have in the question bar throughout the presentations. If they go to something that Chris and Rosalind are discussing right now, we're happy to take them as we go through. If they go to more general questions, we've allotted a good amount of time for Q&A at the end of the session. You could please remember to use safe and respectful language in your questions and please restrict them to the topic and presentations for today. If you feel your question isn't answered, please feel free to get in touch with us and we can do our best to find an answer after the webinar. Finally, please reach out to a trusted friend, colleague or one of the support numbers listed throughout the webinar if you feel you need any additional support. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers Chris Gillick-Moran and Rosalind Morlan. Chris Gillick-Moran is the head of the Suicide and Self-Monitoring System. He has more than 20 years experience in the development of health policy and evidence in the Australian ACT governments. His areas of specialisation include suicide prevention policy, mental health policy, alcohol and other drugs, and the use of data and evidence to inform government decision-making. Rosalind Morland is a senior data scientist and project manager in the unit. Rosalind has been working in the health sector since 2015 as an allied health professional before joining the AIHW in 2017. Her areas of specialisation include biostatistics, epidemiology and public health. It's now my great pleasure to hand to you, Chris and Rosalind. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, um, Matt. That's a wonderful introduction um, uh, to the series of seminars that we'll be running over uh, the rest of this year. Um, very pleased um, to be here with my colleague, Rosalind, who I'll introduce in a, in a moment. Um, I'd just like to also um, acknowledge the fact that my colleagues and myself in Canberra are sitting on uh, the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and the Gauri people. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I would also um, at this stage like to put out uh, an acknowledgement and a thanks um, to members of this uh, forum, this discussion today, but uh, other um, discussions that we've been able to hold with people with lived experience of, of suicidality, both as survivors or, or bereavement. Um, it really has been an incredible privilege to work with the sector to build um, the material that we're going to talk uh, people through today because uh, we quite simply couldn't have got uh, some of the results that we'll be presenting today without that input. So I'm just going to also ask people to note one final thing before we start. Um, people will be aware of the work that we do with um, with every mind and uh, the uh, particularly the uh, communications guidelines um, around that we use it every day in our data and our writing. Um, I'm pleased to let uh, members of this forum know that we're just about to enter into a partnership with every mind to develop a specialized communication and education program for the sector that will sit around um, our system and form a point of um, a proactive consultation for people to uh, get what they need out of the data and to feed uh, back to us what people would like to see. Um, so that should be starting, um, I think we should have that up and ready uh, in the next couple of months. So please do look out for that. And it will augment these kind of activities that we've um, organised with um, uh, Matthew and Star. So with that, I'm going to share my screen, apparently. And we'll start. So first of all, I'd just like to let people know, as Matthew suggested, that you know the questions that people will have, there'll be questions that you have uh, following the, uh, following uh, this discussion that you might want to send through to us. So I've provided two uh, two links there on that front page, and we'll send the slides around so people can, can refer to them. Uh, the first one's our short form URL for the monitoring website, so please bookmark it, uh, go and visit it often, uh, go and visit it uh, from black like behind, a, uh, uh, what do they call those things, Ros, the, where you hide yourself on the internet so that people think you're coming from another country. Yeah, yeah, because that means that I get I get more web hits and it means that I, I beat the other people in the AIHW. But just a second there, we have the suicide monitoring uh, uh, email address, and that goes to all of my team and we get queries through there all of the time. And we do try and turn those around pretty quickly. So whether it's a question about uh, data that we have or data that we might not have or questions about interpreting the data, feel free to just uh, pop that, those questions through to us on those. Uh, so today, we're starting with an introduction to mortality data. As Matthew mentioned, we'll um, come back later in the year and look at some of the morbidity data, ambulance data, and, and some of the modeling. And I suppose before I get into it, I just wanted to emphasize one more thing. And, and that is um, the amount of, um, the amount of engagement we've had with the sector has been very, very useful. And we have been, <coughs> pardon me, we have been able to adjust our language and presentations uh, over the years uh, to incorporate some of, uh, a lot of that feedback. But Unfortunately, at some stages over the discussion today, Ros and I might need to use technical terms that may come across or, or appear um, to not meet those, those guidelines. And so, for example, uh, we won't be discussing um, burden of disease modelling today, but that's an example where we did have a really, really uh, full discussion uh, with the sector about what the best way to formulate um, those particular scientific terms in a way that meant they still carried that technical meaning, but um, perhaps didn't cause as much distress when people were reading them. So if I, if I do use words or I do use words that are in a technical way or a technical form, but uh, please don't be, don't be too upset. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start with myself um, 
talking people through some of the key concepts and definitions uh, for uh, mortality data in Australia. So straight off, mortality data is all causes of death data in Australia. So uh, every person who passes away from whatever cause uh, will have a record uh, made uh, and we'll, we'll see how that sort of gets generated as we go through uh, go through the discussion today. So that's mortality data. Um, that's in distinction to morbidity data, which is a way of talking about non-fatal um, uh, non fatal events where people might be going into a hospital or an ambulance or what have you. Um, so we'll look at some of the strengths and limitations of some of the mortality data that we have in Australia. And Ros will then uh, talk you through some of the key stats that we have in the system, show you where to find them on the system, talk about some of the key points uh, that are in there of interest, and hopefully that will all whet your appetite for heaps of questions. So I didn't tell everyone that you, there's assumed knowledge that I, I, I'm hoping you all bought to the discussion today. I need to assure you that if you can add, subtract, multiply and divide, you'll be able to get through this. So please don't, I don't want data to make people anxious or nervous. Um, oh, we might, just, I don't even think we've even got to do a square root. I'll oh, check that, but no, I think you'll get away with just the big four. So the first key concept uh, in the box on the left there, you'll see the official um, term for the classification that we use when we're looking at coding death data, and that is the World Health Organizational, Organization International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related head pro Health Problems 10th Edition Australian Modification. Uh, we refer to this as ICD 10 AM, uh, otherwise we never actually get to the end of the sentence. So what you can see on the right hand side there is a series of the codes uh, that we use for indicating where a death um, has been by intentional self-harm. Uh, so there's the X series codes there. The distinction between X60 through to X84 is generally around the mechanism of the injury. So that allows us to disaggregate um, suicide death statistics and self-harm statistics according to the mechanism of injury. Um, this is very useful from a, a prevention perspective where we might need to look at uh, emerging patterns of self-harm and how we might intervene, particularly in terms of restrictions to means and access that kind of thing. Uh, just for completeness, there's a little Y code down the bottom there. That's the sequela. I can never pronounce that word. Uh, this is where someone um, has been injured uh, and have been discharged from hospital, but they subsequently die from a complication related to that injury. Um, it's, it, it, in terms of completeness, this is now the standard in Australia is to include the Y codes, but if you do end up with slightly different numbers when you look in different places, check to see if they've included the Y codes, because it's often a really, um, a really simple place to find out where the, the differences lie. Things that are out of scope. Uh, accidental poisoning uh, by and exposure to noxious substances. So this is your accidental overdoses. Um, so while we do have some deliberate poisonings that fall into the intentional self-harm category, where the intent can be determined to be accidental, that is coded separately. Uh, and just finally, we do have events of undetermined intent. Uh, they are not counted in the data that we will present today, but just so uh, people are aware, that's kind of the major classifications where a self-harming event might end up uh, in, in, the, in the data. And a, a note on intent. Uh, this will become uh, more pertinent as we, or, sorry, become more salient as we get towards the morbidity data discussion in the second half of the year. But um, we, we can distinguish within the ICD 10 AM codes whether an act was intentional or if it was accidental. What we cannot code is what the intended outcome of that action was. So when we refer to intentional self-harm codes, that includes all people who harmed themselves with an intent to die by suicide and all people who harmed themselves with some other intent than to die by suicide. In mortality data, that distinction might seem fairly academic because the proportion of people who do not intend to die but 
do die by their stealth injury is actually very, very small in relation to the, the broader group of people who have died by suicide. This ambiguity gets much larger when we get to hospitalizations and we really we'll, we'll, we'll pull that apart later. Oh, sorry, later in the year. And so we've got two main um, sources of data that we're going to talk about today. The Australian Bureau of Statistics causes of death data, um, which you'll hear me refer to sometimes as 3303. I think that's their old catalogue number and they never use it anymore. Um, that data is the source of the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare's National Mortality Index. And that's what my team analyse uh, when we're linking data to the deaths index and that kind of stuff. So, you can almost use those two terms interchangeably. It's just who, who's got the data in their building. Um, the causes of death data is published about nine months after the close of the reference period, which is uh, each calendar year. <clears throat> what we find is that, or what we have found, uh, is that because a number of causes of death and, and suicide, intentional self-harm is amongst these, as, as well as overdoses and a few um, other assaults and, and things, um, sometimes have a larger degree of ambiguity around the intent than um, would be obvious. And it can take quite a while for coroners to reach um, a determination or a conclusion as to whether they should rule a death as um, intentional or accidental. Um, literally, sometimes this can take years. So in 2006, the ABS um, put in place a revisions process whereby the uh, data that they publish uh, at the uh, nine months after the end of the reference period is described as preliminary. And they will then revise that data over the next three or two years of, of data until they reach a final um, position or a final official data uh, at the end of that revision process. Um, after that period, even if something does come in from the coroners, it, it's lost to the system. I have to be upfront with people about that. Um, but this actually is quite a useful um, process to make sure that we can capture as much of the data from the coronial processes as possible, um, whilst also providing a degree of timeliness uh, in the provision of these deaths data, which again, are, are not just for our sector, they're for the entirety of the Australian health and welfare sector to use these data. So we, we do have to strike a balance between that. Um, so when you're looking you're, uh, on the website, you will notice that there's usually a little marker for the preliminary data. So you can know that that data is likely to be revised in subsequent publications. Uh, and just one important distinction to make when we're talking about um, our, our data today, the deaths data, is that there's an important distinction between the year of the death event and the year of the coronial registration of the death. Uh, and usually the Australian Bureau of Statistics will publish on year of registration. They do have a couple of tables in their standard output that use year of death. Um, and we will go through, if there's any marked deviation from that, we'll try and um, draw it out through the presentation. But again, if you're finding that you're looking at data from different places and you're getting slightly different numbers from a query that you thought was the same, check to see if you're getting year of registration or year of death event, because that does make a difference. And just finally, over the last few years, um, well, sorry, I, I need to be um, give credit where it's due. Our colleagues in Victoria and Queensland over a very long period of time, uh, have established uh, state suicide registers. Uh, the, the models in the different jurisdictions are, are different, of course, a wonderful uh, federation base that we have. Um, but the intent is essentially the same. The idea is that uh, deaths that are referred to the coroner as suspected suicide deaths are recorded uh, in these registers. Um, they, they are now available in almost all jurisdictions um, with a, a few exceptions. Um, and we do get regular reporting uh, from these registers uh, as, as well. Um, records are usually coded within 24 to 48 hours of the death, um, which is obviously much, much more um, rapid than nine months after the end of the reference period. Um, and there's generally a high level of concordance between the referrals that are suspected to be suicide deaths and those that are ultimately found to actually be deaths by suicide. It's over 90% concordance. I think I've heard some, uh, some an analysis describe it as 95%. So we're losing a bit of accuracy. We're gaining a lot of time. Um, 
uh, the other thing that the registers are able to do that the official causes of death statistics uh, cannot incorporate is that there's a lot of information in those registers about salient facts or points about a person's identity or life or circumstances that doesn't necessarily flow through uh, the process to the official ABS causes of death data. And, and that's fine because the, the data sources are for different purposes and we, we need to acknowledge that. But we're currently in processes where we're working with some of the suicide registers in the states and territories to see exactly what kind of information they do have in there and what we might be able to do to analyze it. And just a really obvious example off the top of my head uh, is that at, at no point in the ABS causes of death data will you have any indication about um, a deceased person's LGBTQI plus status. Uh, but we do know that where those, those identities are relevant to the um, baronial investigation that they are recorded. And so we may be able to find some things and do some research with the registers that we can't do with the full data set. So at this stage, I think I'm handing over to Rob. And so I'll move and I will slide that over. There we go. Thanks. And if you go to the screen, did you want to go to the Oh no, that's fine. Yeah, we'll yep. we'll just keep doing that. Yep, yep. So just from current slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then I'll to the website. So hello everyone, I am Ros. As um, Chris mentioned, um, I'm going to be taking you through, giving you a little bit of a tour of the data on our website, um, the mortality data. But um, just before I jump into that tour, I just wanted to go over quickly how we measure suicide, particularly over time. Um, so to explain this, I'm going to use an example from the ABS causes of death data on our website. So, for example, the number of deaths by suicide in 1990 was 2,360. The number of deaths by suicide in 2020 was 3,139. So that's a 33% increase in the past 30 years. Now, this is a fairly large number. Does that mean we should be panicking? Not yet. Um, so let's just stop and think about what else has changed over the past 30 years that might explain this increase. So since 1990, the population in Australia has increased by around 50% from 17.1 million to 25.7 million in 2020. And the age distributions of these populations has also changed over time due to people living longer, changes in fertility rates, migration, and various other factors. So in summary, the population in 1990 is very different to 2020. So we need to adjust these for these changes. Otherwise we're comparing apples to oranges. So enter age standardization, a common practice in adjusting for different age structures between populations. Age standardized rates are hypothetical rates that would have been observed if the population being studied had the same distribution as the standard population while all other factors remain unchanged. So to put that in an example, the age standardized rate of deaths by suicide in 1990 was 13.9 per 100,000 population. And that means there was an average 13.9 deaths by suicide per 100,000 people in 1990. In 2020, the age standardized rate of death by suicide was 12.1 per 100,000 population. So this means there was actually a 13% decrease in the rate of death by suicide over the past 30 years. So very different to what we saw before. So I won't go into the specific methods or maths behind age standardization today, um, but just know that when we are talking about an age standardized rate, it means we're looking at a standard population across time to allow for comparisons between populations. It also removes the effect of different age structures. Um, and yeah, so now we're comparing apples to apples. Okay, so now I'm just going to jump to the website. So just I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare. I think so. Yeah, so just bear with me for a second. And where is your website on here? Oh, yeah, it's going to be for the people. 
and this one. Great. Okay, so now I'm just going to take you through. Just make sure that's working. Yep. Okay, that's working. Now I'm going to um, take you through a bit of a tour of the mortality data on our website. So I'm just going to go to deaths by suicide in Australia, and the first one we're going to look at is death by death by suicide over time. Okay, so we're just going to go through this first time series visualization and just see what stories we can pull out and what the data can tell us. Um, so the death by suicide over time page, this page here we're looking at, uh, it provides insights to the ABS causes of death data and it's updated annually every year when new data is released. Um, we usually update within a few days of the ABS release of this data. Um, so looking at this visualization, we have three main lines over time. The top blue line is males, the bottom purple line is females, and the middle yellow line is persons. And what we can see is that males consistently have a higher, oops, sorry, I'm just moving the room thing. Um, males have a consistently higher suicide rate compared to females. And just a reminder, we're looking at age standardized rate. So because of that, variation in overall suicide rates in Australia is for the most part driven to changes in the male suicide rate. So just noting that although males are more likely to die by suicide than females, uh, when we look into hospitalization and ambulance data, we'll see that females are more likely to attempt suicide. So that's for a future webinar. Now, while the reasons for a person's death by suicide is personal and often complex, the overall ups and downs over this time series in rates and numbers um, tend to historically coincide with certain social and economic events. So there are three key stories. There's a lot more stories than that in this visualization, but there are three key ones that I'd like to highlight today. So the first, uh, story I'm going to look at here, uh, the fall in male suicide rates in particular between World War I and World War II. Uh, so a lot of these falls in suicide rates uh, during this time um, is because the Australian service personnel, their deaths where it was suicide or another cause occurred overseas and they weren't included in Australian death registration data, and the population estimates were not adjusted to allow for the absence in those personnel. So that's why we're seeing these very steep declines around this period. Um, a standout is the high rate among males in 1930, uh, 29.8, and that coincides with the Great Depression, which was a period of high unemployment, particularly among males. So if we're moving along the time series, we can see that the age standardized rate for death by suicide increased for both males and females around the 1960s. And that in part is due to the unrestricted availability of barbiturate sedatives. These are a group of drugs that induce sleep and lower anxiety, but are very dangerous and difficult to pre prescribe safely. Overdose, even a little bit of overdose can cause coma and death. So we can see that that drops off exactly at 1967, and that's when regulation of those drugs was introduced. Um, so yeah, there's a little interesting story there. I'm going to move along the timeline to the 1980s to 1990s. Um, this also coincided with a period of economic uncertainty in Australia. I know my parents often talk about this time and how difficult it was to pay a mortgage with three kids uh, when interest rates were very high. Um, and moving along to 2020, so I just mentioned that there was a period of economic uncertainty back here, and certainly there would be some uncertainty in 2020, 2021, but the, we don't have 2021 data yet. That'll come out in September. But data from the suicide registers, uh, which Chris mentioned earlier, and we're going to look at soon, 
um, did, has not seen an increase in the number of suspected suicides uh, referred to the coroner's court, despite the social and economic disruption related to COVID-19. So Chris also mentioned in his presentation that from 2006, I'm just adjusting the slider here, from 2006, ABS changed their revision process to improve data quality by enabling the revision of cause of death for open coroner court cases over time. So prior to this, we have a rough idea, a fairly good idea of trends and what was happening. But following for this revision, we have a much better idea and the data quality is improved. So I'm gonna move on from this time series. Oh, but just before I do, just a reminder, we were looking at age standardized rate. So we were comparing apples to apples when we were comparing two time points. But if I swap to number on the visualization here, we can see that the number of suicides does increase over time, but that's just due to population changes. Our population has increased. So I'm just going to scroll down to groups. Okay. So this visualization, suicide deaths by age and sex. This is an age specific rate, which is calculated in a similar way to a crude weight, which is just simply the number of events over a population. Except for an age specific rate, oh, I, sorry, Chris is back. For an age specific rate, um, the number of suicide deaths and the denominator population are restricted to a given age group. So that's why it's called age specific rate. So we're looking at 2020, but you can adjust um, the slider down here to change the years. We're just gonna look at 2020 for today. Um, probably one of the biggest standouts here is this males 85 plus age group um, at 36.2 deaths per 100,000 population. However, we have to keep in mind that the actual number of deaths in this age group is much lower, particularly compared to the middle age groups. Um, and that's just because that's a smaller age group for males 85 and over, um, but the proportion of deaths is quite high in that age group. So I'm gonna go back to age specific, right? So it's just important to keep these little things in mind when you're looking at data. It's like, well, why is that standing up? Oh, because the population is quite small. Um, so I'm gonna go over to where a larger number of deaths occurred and looking at males. Uh, the 40 to 44 age group and the 50 to 54 age group in males um, had high rates of um, deaths by suicide. And if we took the 40, 40 year olds to 54 year olds, that would represent a bit over a quarter of all male suicide deaths. So that's about 27%. If I jump over to females, the highest, the age group with the highest suicide rate was the 45 to 49 age group. And they represented about 10% of all female suicides for 2020. Scrolling down. Okay, so this section looks at how the method of suicide has changed over time. We have a content warning in this visualization, and I'm actually not going to look at it today. So I'm not going to click the proceed to visualization button. Um, however, if you would like to go through this visualization with myself and Chris, please feel free to contact us and we'll talk to, talk to you about it offline. But I am going to give you a little bit of a summary. Um, so trends of methods used for suicide uh, has changed greatly over time as new methods become available or as restrictions to the availability of some methods are introduced. So one example that we discussed earlier on was the availability of barbiturate sedatives in the 1960s, and that contributed to suicide deaths by, due to poisonous substances, which declined in response to new regulation in 1967. There was also a decline in poisonings by gas as the amount of carbon monoxide permitted in the exhaust gas cars was reduced in 1997. Gun control reforms in 1996 after Port Arthur coincide with a steep decline in suicide by firearms. Um, so that's just a bit of a summary about what you'd see in this visualization. Uh, again, if you'd like to go through it with us, just let us know, send us an email. So 
So I'm going to now, I'm going to scroll back up. And I'm going to move on to the cohort analysis of deaths by suicide. Okay, so this visualization shows us how suicide rates have changed in people within each birth cohort as they age. So we've got all the, each line here represents a birth cohort. So for example, this light blue line is 1969 to 1973. Anyone born between those years? And Chris just put his hand up that, that this is Chris's line. Um, and uh, where's my line? Let's see if I can find it. I think, oh, I'm not that young. Oh, I'm this one, 1989 to 1993. I'm not gonna tell you which year. Um, so, yeah, as I said, each line represents a cohort and we've got the age groups on the x-axis. And this just gives us a, a little bit of an overview of how the age group at risk might change depending on when you're born. So if we look at this age group, 1964-1968, the age group that had the highest um, suicide rate was, the, was males, oh sorry, if we're just looking at males, um, was the 30 to 34 age group. But if you were born a little bit later in 1969 to 1973, um, that has shifted to 25 to 29, so a little bit younger. Um, so there's some interesting comparisons there. For males, the suicide rates tend to hang around between 20 and 40, tend to be the higher suicide rates. But if we swap to females, which I can down here, um, females across all of the cohorts, well, most of the cohorts, they their suicide, the age that they die by suicide um, tends to be in the later age groups. So as they get older, the suicide rate tends to increase and that's a consistent pattern across all the age cohorts. All right, so now I'm just gonna scroll down to the age. So another visualization that's similar, but a little bit different because we have on the X axis down the bottom, we have the age cohorts and this time each line represents an age group and what's interesting about this visualization we are looking at females now by the way is that we can see the change in the suicide rate particularly in this aged 15 to 19 age group where the rate of suicide is about 1.8 times higher in those born in 1999 to 2003 compared to those born in 1954 to 1958. Um, and this wasn't observed in males. But for males, just hop over to males, um, there's no clear pattern. Rates at younger ages of death, around 15 to 19 to 20 to 24, tended to be higher in those born before 1979. Um, than those born in more recent cohorts. Did you have anything you'd like to add in the cohort study? In here for a minute. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to um, just draw to people's attention um, in terms of the cohort, and you are absolutely correct, uh, Rose, to draw out that that um, that early Gen X um, cohort. Um, had highest rates of uh, suicide deaths in, in young populations and it's been thankfully that's been ebbing down for males but I just wanted to draw people's attention to the fact that we are seeing more fatalities in younger age cohorts for females and that's you can see we've only got a few preliminary data points here um, mind you the rates are still much lower than uh, for males at the same age but that's creeping up um, and we can see that in the data there, and it's something that we need to keep an eye on. Chris, Ros, we've had a question about this data. Looking at the age rates by birth year shows different age peaks. Does this mean that year of birth is less important than external factors that apply equally to all age groups, but around the same time? a really interesting question. Um, if you look at some of the age cohort analysis for um, other um, causes of death besides um, intentional self-harm, um, particularly around overdose deaths, uh, opioid overdose deaths in particular, 
you'll find a similar pattern in the distribution in the age cohorts. And so I think the, I, I think what's happening with this analysis is it's showing us that there are sets of exposures to risk factors that accrue to a age cohort that they carry through with them uh, through the rest of their life. And so the, if, if we cast our mind back to, when did I graduate? Well, I was 1988. What was happening in 1988 when my, my cohort was um, had the highest rates there? We had a huge recession and a lot of people going straight out of high school into unemployment. And if you go straight out of high school into unemployment, well, chances of you to maintain that unemployed status throughout your life is hugely increased because you don't get that break early on. At the end of the Cold War, there was heaps of heroin and drugs around the place. It was a very difficult time to be uh, a young person. And particularly with that employment um, issue that I mentioned, that will get carried through uh, with, the, with them. That's not to say that um, what the immediate stresses that people may be facing may be common. So for example, uh, oh, I'm just trying to think of an example. Uh, if, if we find that um, uh, with more increased mortgage stress, for example, over the next 12 months, which is quite likely that we'll see that come out in the data, that will be something that will affect people like across the board, regardless of their age. It's more to do about what's their exposure to mortgage stress rather than their age. So I'm not sure if that really unpicks that, but I'm gonna just stop there. Thanks, Chris. It's all really interesting to pull out all these different stories and um, what the data tells us. Um, so I'm gonna move on to states and territories, which is just the next tab. Down. Okay, so this visualization, I like to call visualizations that look like this spaghetti because it looks like spaghetti. <laughs> um, or Chris calls it an ugly baby. Um, there's lots of lines overlapping, but what I like about this is, is what you can actually de spaghettify it. That is the technical term. So let's say I just wanted to look at New South Wales and Victoria. I can just look at those two, but I'm going to re it, um, and we're just going to have a look. So this visualization is actually quite a good example of what happens when you start to drill down on suicide numbers from a national level, even at the state and territory level, which is still a fairly high aggregation. We is, we're starting to see large variations in rates due to small numbers, especially in um, states and territories like Northern Territory, Tasmania, um, ACT. Um, so looking at Northern Territory, we can see that the rates jump up and down all over the place. And some time periods are suppressed. They're not even on here because the numbers are too small to calculate a rate and we can't report it. Um, but ignoring the bouncing ball is what we called it the other day and just looking at the overall trend, you can see um, where, wh which way the trend is going and it's, it's staying fairly central in this, this middle area here. Um, I'm gonna jump over to number. So remember Northern Territories was at the top for age standardized rate, but when I swapped, stopped, swapped to number, they're at the bottom of the list for number of suicides and all we're looking at here is basically the population sizes, with New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria um, being at the top. So um, I'm gonna hop over to suicide registers now. Do you have anything to add? All good, no worries. Okay, so data from the suicide registers. Um, Chris, talked about this in um, when he was taking you through his part of the presentation. Um, but as he said, the data from the suicide registers are based on initial police reports and other information available at the time of referral to the coroner. The numbers we're looking at here today aren't directly comparable with data released from the ABS, the data we just looked at, um, because the ABS data is based on final coronial determinations. However, the differences tend to be quite small. Um, Victoria especially have got it down to 95% accuracy. It's, it's pretty close. 
Um, so this this web page here it, it um has suspected deaths by suicide for Victoria, uh, for Queensland, and for New South Wales. Um, but today I'm just going to look at Victoria. Um, where are we? Okay, so this first visualization. Firstly, I'll, I will apologize. It's a static visualization. It's not interactive like the other ones, but we are making an interactive version um, and that should be coming out soon. But um, putting that aside, this shows the monthly variation in suspected suicides. So each line represents a year. It looks very much like spaghetti. Um, and it's just showing you how much it varies over the 12 months, which is quite a lot because when we're talking about small numbers, um, an increase, so if you've got one suspected suicide and the next month it increases to two, it looks like a 100% increase, but the numbers are still very small. Um, they do bounce all over the place. Um, but these fluctuations tend to even out over the course of the year, and we do need to look at this overall trend, so this solid line in the middle, it's, it's staying pretty flat. Um, now, Ross, just, yep. I, I see you've got, I think the latest data there is February 2022. That's obviously a long way improved from the annual ABS data, but mm. it's we're coming into June, so there's still a lag there. And Chris mentioned that that data is entered around 48 hours after. Why that gap? Is there something that's happening to the data in, in the interim or are we getting closer to an even more real-time presentation? Just go on. Look, 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 step in on that one if you like, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a good question, uh, Matt. Um, there's, there's nothing occurring with the data. The, the lag there is the um, time it takes between the coroners preparing the reports that they provide to us. Um, and us republishing them. So I think I just saw that the new New South Wales data is about to come out tomorrow, I think. Um, we've got updated data that's been published from Victoria already. So, so we'll update that. Um, but the data is available to the coroners and the jurisdictions. So that's the, the main um, benefit of the suicide registers is that jurisdictions with responsibility for helping communities and people who might be identified in this data as it comes out can do so relatively quickly. Um, we'd like to be able to publish it uh, more rapidly, but it's um, we're secondary users of the data. The primary purpose is to assist um, coroners provide information to support communities. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to scroll down to the second visualization now. Um, and this one is the cumulative number of suspected suicides um, month by month. So remember this is month by month, so you'd expect to see it trending upwards as the number of, as the, the year progresses. Um, but this is just interesting to see how, um, which direction, how steep that direction is going throughout a year um, in, in a given year with each line being a different year. Um, but in addition to these visualizations, um, this data, these data for each year from 2016 to 2021 in Victoria showed that around three quarters of suspected deaths by suicide were among males. The majority of suspected deaths by suicide for both males and females occurred in those aged between 25 and 54. And around two thirds of those suspected deaths um, by suicide occurred in metropolitan locations. All right, so I'm going to move on to young people now. Right, so death by suicide among young people. Okay, so suicide is a leading cause of death among Australians aged 15 to 24. But one of those reasons, one of the reasons for that is that the proportion of deaths by suicide is relatively high among those age groups due to the fact that those age groups tend not to die from other causes. I'm just keeping that in mind. Um, so deaths by suicide represented about 31% of all deaths in young people aged 15 to 17, this age group here, and about 39% in those aged 18 to 24. Um, in children 14 and below, 
the proportion of deaths by suicide um, is low compared to these other two age groups. And it represented about 12% of all deaths in that age group. If I swap to numbers, it's a, it's a similar um, thing that we saw for the age standardized rate um, that with these numbers being quite low. You'd like to add? Yep. I, did, I did, thank you, Ron. I just did want to step in and make one observation for participants, uh, and that is around the categorization of 14 and below. Um, there are, are publications where data agencies will publish um, sort of 12 to 14, uh, some younger than that. We made a deliberate decision to mark um, that category as 14 and below, uh, because the point at which a young person is capable of understanding the finality of a self-harm act is a matter for debate amongst developmental psychologists. And it's certainly not something that we are in a position to make a call on. So that's why we have deliberately put 14 and below. I draw that out because that has been reported um, in the media as, well, obviously it must include people as young as two or five. And it's like, well, we're not quite sure that it does, but I just thought I'd drag uh, that little bit of clarity out. Thanks, Chris. All right, and now I'm gonna hop over to uh, Suicide and Indigenous Australia. Okay, so, while it's very clear from this visualisation that suicide is much higher among Indigenous Australians compared to non-Indigenous, um, I did just want to mention that monitoring suicide Indigenous Australians is challenging due to data quality issues. So analysing trends for Indigenous Australians, um, it needs to be interpreted with caution due to the under-identification of Indigenous people in deaths data and the uncertainties in estimating and projecting the size and structure of that underlying denominator population over time. And age standardized rates based on only a small number of deaths can vary um, significantly over time. That's what I mentioned before, when you have, when you jump from one to two, it looks like a 100% increase. Um, so you just need to be careful. And then as identifying Indigenous, Australia, um, Indigenous status among death data improves, it might account for a rise in case numbers and rates for suicide as well. So that suicide was always there, but it just might have been identified that that belonged to an Indigenous person where it wasn't previously identified. So we just need to keep those um, caveats in mind. Um, however, the age standardised rate among Indigenous Australians is 2.4 times higher than non-Indigenous. And in a previous webinar we did, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in a future one, our univariate regression model um, also estimated that the hazard rate ratio of Indigenous Australians, um, so their, their risk of suicide was about two times higher. So that's what we um, predicted with our model and that's what we're seeing in the real admin data. So it's a sign of a good regression model. So I'm going to move on to Australian Defence Force Suicide Monitoring. Okay, so this, this visualisation is pretty interesting. You can um, compare the service category um, to different service categories. But what we're seeing overall in this default selection is that ex-serving males um, has a higher risk of suicide than males who are in reserve or um, permanent members. And ex-serving males are 24% more likely to die by suicide than other Australians. Um, and ex-serving females, it's twice as likely. Um, I didn't have too much to say on this visualisation unless you had something you wanted to point out, Chris. It's all fairly straight. straight. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, I think all of that mentioned right now, mm -hmm. I won't stick my head in the way, oh, maybe I will. Um, uh, we are in the process, we, there's a separate area within the AIHW with responsibility for veteran and defence suicide. So that's my colleague, Paul Pham. Uh, he's leading the engagement of the AIHW with the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide. 
um, and I can let our participants know that the Royal Commission are very interested in our data and we've, we've we've spent quite a bit of time preparing briefing material together with Paul for that so it's a really um, tangible way that people can see that we're using the data to inform public discussion and debate. Okay so now I'm going to look under the geography section and we're going to look at suicide by remote area. So similar to when we looked at state and territory, um, we can see that suicide rates fluctuate as um, remoteness increases. So as we move from major cities to inner regional, out of regional remote, and all the way to very remote, we do see a lot of variation because the population sizes are getting smaller. Um, but again, ignoring the bouncing ball, what we're really looking at here is that the rate of suicide increases with increasing remoteness overall. Um, so if we swap to numbers, that's where you can see a clear effect of population size with remote and very remote being right down the bottom. Um, and while major cities did have the highest number of suicides relative to their population, it's lower. So this is where the age standardized rate really does come in handy. I'm going to hop over to PHNs now. This one um, actually shows a similar story to the one we just looked at. So this purple line in the middle is um, the, the national average. Um, and you can select your PHN using this drop down. The default is just Adelaide because it's top of the list, top of the alphabet. <laughs> yeah. um, but what we see is a similar pattern. The uh, PHN areas that have a lower rate of suicide tend to be your major cities. And as we go up, up and up and up, we start to get more remote. Like we've got Darling Downs and West Morton, uh, Northern Territory. We start to see higher rates in these more remote PHN areas. Um, but again, if we swap to number, you'll see the, the opposite story. It's almost like it flips when you look at number. All right, going to go look at our maps now. Suicide by local areas. Okay, this is our Esri map, which I think is pretty cool. Oh, yes. Um, we did win an award for this map actually it was the i can't remember the exact name of the award but it was a it was a big esri award um and it was international there were over 300 or even more 300 thousand participants um and we we came number one um and it was a pretty big deal so we're, we're very happy with ourselves um so uh first things first to this map um i just want to acknowledge the gray areas they are our blanks so if i were to click on one of these areas um, you can see the age standardized rate we've got np and that means we couldn't publish that rate because the, no the number of deaths is it's too small that we can't actually make a rate for that area um, but we want to acknowledge these data quality issues um, and we are working on them but excluding those blank areas um, the darker blue areas indicate areas with higher rates of suicide and as it gets lighter lower rates of suicide so i'm going to zoom into a few different areas so if you think back to our um remoteness <coughs> pardon me our remoteness visualization and how as you increase your remoteness the rate tends to increase we do see that on this map here with the inner city areas as we come out of that the rate of suicide tends to go up um, so if I, Melbourne's another good example of that so going to Melbourne around this inner city area suicide rates are, are lower and the further you get away from those inner city areas um, the higher well, the suicide rate tends to go up as well there's a few areas with very high rates. Apologies, I've just got a bit of a dry throat. 
This one. Um, so Kimberley in Western Australia is a standout with a age standardised rate of 35.4. Um, there was regions in Queensland as well, which are quite obvious even when you've zoomed right out. Um, while lower areas, well, we, we already looked at quite a few of those, um, Parramatta in Sydney, um, Rockdale, they all have quite low rates of suicide. So, so the closer you are to those major cities, the lower the rates of suicide, even though in those graphs we saw before the numbers are higher. Um, do you want to add anything to the map, Chris? Um, I'm, I'm, before I do move on though, sorry, I just remembered I should probably show you the cool features of this map. <laughs> um, so obviously you can search for a location here. Um, if you click on this little folder, you get all the different map layers. And that's just a fancy way of saying you can change what you're looking at. So at the moment, we're looking at statistical area three, which is the lowest aggregation we could get to. Um, but you can change it from 2015 to 2019 to 2014 to 2018, or you can look at a higher statistical area, um, SA4. Um, and in SA4, you can also just look at males or you can just look at females. So you can change the map to whatever suits your needs, which is quite handy. Um, you, there's the filter option. That's sort of a quick way to do it. Um, and then you can filter by area and it'll just take you to where you want to go. Okay, so next one is international estimates of suicide. Okay, so this visualization compares Australia to international estimates. We've aggregated them on this little homepage to the P20 and who? Um, and just keep in mind when you're comparing Australia's suicide rates to other countries, <clears throat> they're not exactly directly comparable due to different counting rules, data quality, and several other factors that might impact the suicide rates. But it gives you some idea where Australia sits with the rest of the world, which is fairly high, but I'm gonna show you who regions. So this is Australia compared to all who regions. And in this visualization, you have quite a lot of different options that you can um, change in the biz. So let's say I wanna look at Western Pacific region and how that compares, I can add that in. And I can also change the, um, the measures. Uh, we're looking at age standardized rate, um, but perhaps we wanna look at an age specific rate and look at the different age groups. That's quite a useful tool. Yeah. Can we jump in? Yeah. I did want to jump in. I want to give a break because you're doing such an excellent job, but to, I just wanted to drag out a little bit more detail around what Ros was referring to about the uh, caution in making direct comparisons between countries. And Ros has mentioned the data quality issues, uh, of course. Um, one of the other confounding issues in international comparisons is around. Um, residual stigma and legal consequences around suicidal behaviour that will cause um, some systems to make more conservative assessments about whether or not a death was suicide than perhaps a similar decision might be made in Australia where we have a, um, a, a, after a lot of work by your sector, I should say, over a very long period of time, manage to reduce a lot of the stigma around help seeking suicidality, mental ill health and other other issues. Um, essentially, when I talk to people internationally and they ask me why is Australia have such massive problems with drug and alcohol overdoses, uh, suicidality and uh, and other issues like this, I guess because we count them better than other people because we've managed to remove a large part of the stigma associated with that. So. Yeah, it's a really good point. It like, came up a lot in the conference we attended recently yeah. as well. Okay, so um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move on from international. And we are going to look at on the behaviours and risk factors. Suicide by socioeconomic.
Um, this visualization does have a content warning on the front. I am going to click on it this time. Um, but the reason why it has the content warning is because uh, you'll see in a second, there's some options in there um, to look at mechanisms of suicide. And we're just going to look at all mechanisms combined today. Um, and again, if you want to go through the mechanisms individually and you'd like to, Chris and I to go through that with you, just contact us. But um, here we're looking at the different socioeconomic quintiles with quintile one being um, the lowest socioeconomic area or the most disadvantaged. Quintile five is the highest socioeconomic area and the least disadvantaged. <clears throat> okay, so in quintile one, we can see that suicide rates are much higher than if we compare it to the least disadvantaged. And I'm sure there are no surprises there. And we just see this, this um, clear decrease as disadvantage decreases, so does your rate of suicide, basically. Um, anything else to add on that one? No, that's pretty straightforward. Nothing's too surprising. Um, the last one. Just give people a teaser for the fact that in the modeling and regression one, we'll be able to start unpicking the relationships mm. between all of these things. Yes, I was thinking about mentioning it, but I wasn't 100% sure. So, um, we do have a modeling study coming out um, soon, which unpicks this a little bit more where we're looking at, are you talking about the income one or the? Just generally. Oh, just general. oh yeah, so we have this published as well. Um, how your disadvantage, your socioeconomic risk factors um, for suicide can affect your risk of suicide. Um, so I believe we looked at it last uh, webinar and I'm sure we'll look at it again. Um, so key economic, socioeconomic risk factors like unemployment, um, your housing, um, household composition, yeah, all of those different factors. How does that influence your risk of suicide? So that's a really interesting study. If you want to find it, it's under, um, where is it? Social and economic factors um, and suicide. And there's some really interesting things in there. All right, so we'll move on to despair. Yeah. Okay, so deaths of despair. So where this comes from is that uh, in America, they observed an increase in the overall mortality of middle-aged white non-Hispanic -Hispan people due to deaths by suicide, drug and alcohol poisonings, uh, deaths due to chronic liver diseases such as cirrhosis. And all these deaths were termed deaths of despair by the authors Case and Deaton. They linked that there was a trend in economic security, a lack of universal health care, and widespread availability of opioids in the US um, to these deaths. So we wanted to investigate these deaths of despair in Australia to see if there was anything similar going on. And what we found is that Australians are not increasingly dying due to these deaths of despair over time, unlike we see in America. Um, so yeah, there, there's no clear trend over this whole, whole time period in these deaths of despair, but it's still really interesting to explore and monitor and to keep an eye on. <laughs> yeah. um, those were all the mortality pages that we were gonna go through today. So I'm gonna throw to Chris to see if he has anything to add. And then I guess we can go to questions. Yeah. yeah. I'll just, um... uh, thank you very much, Roz. I'm going to stop sharing. And now we're back. So, um, so look, I hope um, people found that a sort of a relatively quick step through what is quite a large amount of, of data and visualizations that um, uh, Roz and the team have built over the over the last few years for us. Um, one thing I wanted to emphasize for participants today is that all the data that is presented on our website can be downloaded. All the underlying data is available so that you can manipulate that uh, in a way that best suits your own um, research interests or your own questions. And again, if at any point people have questions about how to use the data or whether or not they've perhaps got the wrong end of the stick on how to interpret something, those um, 
that email address that I gave at the beginning um, is a great place for me to get the team on to answer your questions. But I'm happy to just open up to questions now, Matt. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Roslyn, for that walk through what is indeed a national data asset. Just a reminder for anyone that does have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A part of the Zoom webinar. We've had one come in that goes to really what's happening to an individual before a suicide death. In this case, the example was men experiencing separation. I think it goes to a broader question of the social determinants, Chris and Roslyn, do we have any data looking at mortality on what's happened to individuals prior to a death by suicide? It's a, it's a really good um, question, Matt, and, and thank, the, uh, thank the participant for uh, putting it through. Um, we actually don't, um, by and large. We do have some, Australia does have some excellent longitudinal data assets that we've yet to turn our attention to. And they're the kind of data sets where they do follow people over time. Uh, it's uh, much easier to identify a particular series of circumstances that might um, be proximal to a person's death by suicide. So we, we can't readily tease out the proximity of some of those, like the proximity and time of some of those risk factors to a death by suicide. But on, on the whole, we can get some insights to them. So that uh, modeling that was described uh, a bit before by uh, Roz, we can tease out that um, uh, marital status, household composition, uh, does have an interaction with a person's um, relative risk of dying by suicide. Um, a bit similar to the discussion we had around the birth cohort stuff as well. We can't quite get to the proximity. So we don't know um, from the data we have um, whether, uh, say, for example, a separation event for a, a, a male, as, your, as the questioner mentioned, we don't know if that uh, risk lessens over time, for example or if it accrued to, you know, towards the, um, the immediate separation event. There, there is research that goes into this. There are studies that look at these things, but we, we haven't quite got there yet. Thanks, Chris. Some of our uh, audience will be familiar with the National Coronial Information System and the national work that's been underway there for, I think, around 20 years now. How does your system and, and that uh, system interact, if at all? Oh, okay. Well, we, we, we do have an uh, interaction. So um, uh, the suicide registers data that Roz uh, uh, demonstrated earlier um, is the original source of all um, causes of death data. Uh, sorry, I'm just about to completely mislead people. It is, the, it is the source for coronially determined deaths. So keep in mind that the vast majority of deaths in Australia are doctor certified. And so they never end up with a coronial investigation or what have you. So it's only certain deaths, depending on the legislation in each jurisdiction that gets referred to the coroner. There is then a, a standard national sort of set of data that gets extracted from each of those state and territory um, coronial systems and gets put into the national coronial information system where they, uh, recode it according to the national standards. That database is the point of origin for what becomes the ABS causes of death data, and then eventually the AIHW's national death index. So, so it's uh, sort of in the pipeline of data supply from the original coronial investigation to what ends up on the ABS and our website. Thank you. We've had another question. How were the categories of indication determined, specifically around the behaviours and risk factors? How, how was that developed? Um, can I, can, sorry, can I just ask a clarification on that? So was there a particular presentation that the questioner had in mind? I might ask our questioner to uh, maybe add any any further details. There, there was a, another one that I I'm, will... Um, go to while that takes place. What's done with the data collected where a specific reason is known, i.e. clear indication of a particular life event 
or disease or circumstance or even a note? And do these reasons give insight into the categories measure? Which I think is, is related to that earlier question as well. Okay. So just in terms of the, the categories, I just because we do have quite a few different classifications and I just want to make sure I'm uh, uh, answering the uh, specific question uh, that's been put to us. But just in terms of that second question, um, and I'm, I'm going to interpret that second question as the categories of being um, intentional, uh, accidental or, or um, uh, undetermined because I'm, I'm and I'm doing that because of that part of the question that said like if there is information like a note or a particular knowledge of a life stress or event um, that information is um, uh, is collated by the coroner where relevant and where it's available um, and that will be used to inform decisions that the coroner makes um, you know clearly if there is a, a note um, and a high a high level of lethality in the mean selected. There's things that the coroner will be able to say, look, it's quite clear that this is a suicide death. And they might make recommendations as well around, um, well, it's, you know, perhaps this person had been discharged from hospital and this indicates that there should be more aftercare provided or, or recommendations like this. Th those additional pieces of information do not flow through from the coroners to the NCIS to the ABS us, which is why we do commission bits of research where we get university researchers to go in and do work specifically with um, the registers to look at some of that more contextual data that's, um, that's around. And a great example of that, it, it was presented at IASP Gold Coast two weeks ago now, seems like a lifetime ago, um, but there was the COVID-19 research that we commissioned at the University of Melbourne uh, led, uh, and that was looking at uh, contextual information in suicide registers in Tasmania, Victoria, and Queensland to see what affects certain parts of the uh, community response to COVID might have contributed to any changes in patterns of suicidality. So we, we knew, uh, we could tell from the initial uh, register data that there were no large fluctuations in the numbers or rates of deaths being referred to the coroner. We wanted to look if there was a change in the type or the, the, the contextual um, the contextual information. And so that's an exact example where we might go, oh, was, were people reacting to uh, lockdown or, you know, but yeah, we, so we, we are able to do that. I'm still, oh, I still need um, the earlier question to clarify which sort of categories they're referring to. Sure, any of our, our question that and wanted any further information on that, please feel free to add that question. We've got a question on the other side of that equation though, around where, uh, where debts are not determined or intent couldn't be determined. Is there any research work being done or proposed on reviewing those debts in that category to look at potentially the undercounting of the suicide rate or highlighting some challenges in making coronial determinations. Yeah, look, and, and I actually, I started looking at precisely this. I must have had a, like a sixth sense that this was going to come up because it, there's actually, if we look at the undetermined intent cases, um, about, about 75%, maybe just under 75% are accounted for by three categories. And so the three uh, categories that make that up are poisonings, drownings, particularly for young males, and uh, some motor vehicle accidents. Um, and these are the areas where there can be the most amount of ambiguity around the intent. Um, if, you know, I don't want to make up examples because there's too many real life examples that people know with and, and live with. But you, you could imagine that, say, for instance, um, if I was intoxicated and I'd gone for a swim outside of the flags, you know, after dark, someone might go, wow, that's pretty dangerous behaviour, but I might not have left a note or, and they might go, well, we actually don't know what the intent there was. Um, and so I just, so, so we can look at those categories. Um, the person to refer to 
around those. I'm going to drop my ABS colleague Lauren Moran in the uh, in the mix. Um, if people want um, to have a bit more of a chat with Lauren about how her team go through and make some of those um, determinations themselves, because they don't always line up with the coronial recommendations, she'd probably be the better person to talk around the actual the actual method that her team uses to do the coding. Any relation? There's not nepotism in the uh, in the data world. Oh, absolutely nepotism in the data world, uh, Matthew. No, I, um, I'm from the good side of the Moran clan. We have nothing to do with the Melbourne mob. I don't know where Lauren's family sit in relation to those Melbourne people. You touched on a, a slight decrease in suicide deaths during the course of the pandemic in that data we have to date. And I, it seems like a, um, a stabilisation in the next year that we'll see. That's overall, are you able to discern any trends in, um, in cohorts within that, particularly priority groups where that trend is um, the other way? Uh, we're very concerned about the pattern of both death by intentional self-harm and non-fatal intentional self-harm around young women. And it was a, it's a trend that has been um, emerging before COVID and it has continued um, I don't think we could, I don't think we have enough information to determine whether it's accelerating or not, but it certainly is continuing to increase. And we are seeing that pattern across all of our major data sets. So we're seeing that in our um, causes of death data, we're seeing that in our ambulance attendance data, we're seeing it in our hospitalizations data. Um, so yes, that's uh, again, coming from a relatively low base rate, but it's certainly increasing. And, and we're not quite sure why that is. About this time last week, New South Wales became the final state to pass voluntary assisted dying legislation. We know there's been some analysis of coronial data that points to people with a terminal illness taking their lives. If those people would now be counted under a, a different regime, do you expect that to have any implications for future mortality data? Uh, well, it will have implications uh, for future mortality data and, and how we actually manage that will be uh, something we'll need to work through. So I think, um, Matt, you and I have uh, caught up before. Um, the current coding standard for, um, for coding deaths of people who have accessed voluntary end of life um, legislation uh, is that the death will be coded to the underlying cause that uh, the doctor certified would enable access to those to those um, those systems, but we will know how many people have chosen to use those um, systems. So we, we will still be able to see whether people um, whether there's an increase in people accessing uh, accessing those services or people who are choosing to end their own life separately from that system. So yeah, we, we will be able to see it, but just the, the cancer deaths will get, sorry, terminal cancer death patients who have access to assisted dying will be coded to cancer. Uh, we've just got a, a couple of final questions. You touched on some of the international data and, and differences in, in quality and other factors there. Are there out other countries that do things better or, or differently? Do you learn lessons from your international counterparts that are informing the work of the national system? So in terms of, of data collection? Yeah, collection, quality analysis. Yeah, absolutely. So who does it best? Who does it best? Well, I, I can tell everyone on, on the line that the people who do ambulance data the best is us. It's Australia. It's all of you guys because no one else collects it or does it at the systematic level that we do. And we've got a lot of people um, very interested in that. Um, some of the things that have been quite interesting to look at um, for example, some of the work that is done in Ireland um, around sentinel monitoring of presentations to emergency departments um, is something that we're looking at very closely. Um, emergency department data in Australia uh, across the board um, tends to be of a poorer quality than other data. Um, and we frequently cannot even identify that 
an injury that a person may have sustained was intentionally inflicted by themselves. Um, so if I present to Calvary Hospital just a few blocks away from here and I have a laceration to my arm, uh, they will go presented with laceration on arm, sutured, discharged or admitted. Um, that they will not get to the intent. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but trying to get a better handle on what's happening in the emergency department is one of our key areas that we want to go uh, to explore further. There's some excellent work being done in Australia. So I know that Origin and um, Joe Robinson in Melbourne have, have been doing work on some Sentinel uh, ED, uh, ED locations around Victoria. There's some stuff that has been done by Grant Farah and his team in the mental health information area of New South Wales Health. Uh, and there's some, there's some research that's come out of the Gold Coast as well, um, I understand. It's been ongoing for some time. They're all slightly different ways of coming at the same problem. Um, but certainly we, we ha have had to take a bit of a, a look at what's happening overseas to see how we might fix that particular problem. Um, in terms of the actual mortality data, I, I think we're as good as it gets, um, really. Um, I mean, some of those other areas that we'll turn our attention to later in the seminar series in the year that we will really have to um, be upfront with participants and let them know where our system's really not working quite yet. I promise just two more questions, but we've had a, a couple more come in. Um, one acknowledges that for the reasons you've outlined, absolute international numbers are, are hard to compare directly, but are there observable trends with regards to increases or, or otherwise that you have been able to compare over time? Are, are we seeing, you know, globally a, a decrease post pandemic or I know there were some increases during the global financial crisis. Are the international spaghetti charts pretty consistent? Yeah, the, the international spaghetti charts are fairly consistent. Um, in terms of the pandemic, um, uh, interruption to the time series. Um, most of the places around the world that we've been keeping an eye on have been very similar to Australia in um, no large changes that would make us call a trend for over that period. It's all fairly consistent to what we were observing before COVID. Um, there has been some material that's come out of Japan and I think it was presented um, by one of the researchers who was visiting at IASP a couple of weeks ago as well. There's some specific things happening there, again, with young women, um, uh, probably a little bit of an older cohort than we're looking at here in Australia. That does seem to have occurred around the COVID period. And we're not quite sure, um, in talking to our Japanese colleagues, we're not quite sure what's driving that. It may have something to do with um, the security of employment tenure, you know, compared to if males compared to females in the Japanese economy, we really don't know. But people do go to the international comparisons um, chart. I mean, invite people to pull up the Russian Federation because it is extraordinary. Um, the, the fall over the last 30 plus years that's occurred um, in a lot of those ex-Soviet republics. Uh, and so you can see very, very clearly uh, the point at which the Soviet Union collapsed, the economy went completely catastrophic, people lost their entire life savings, they lost their jobs, they lost everything. Uh, and then you have ready, readily available large amounts of vodka and you, it was a recipe for disaster and you can see it in the data, but they've slowly been able to bring that down over time. Um, I'm not sure whether that's simply through the stabilising of their economy over time, or if they're, I don't know what the suicide prevention um, sector looks like in the Russian Federation, but it's certainly one that people can see where there's exogenous shocks to the system playing out in, in rates of, of suicide. We've had some clarification of that earlier oh, question, okay. and I think it, it touches on something you, you answered in that first question around reasons that relate to other risk factors or, or things that might uh, have taken place before a suicide death, the examples given have been losing a child or, or recent unemployment. Uh, I think you, you've answered 
that that's a, a bit of a gap, but something that could be looked at in the future. So clearly some appetite across the sector to better understand what's happening before a suicide death in those different uh, transition and um, risk factors that happen in, in the life course. Okay. Yeah, and I think there, is, there is some um, data available on our site that people uh, can look at the uh, to answer some of that, and oh, sorry, I'm accidentally reading Ros's emails for a minute. Um, I hope she's not saying anything nasty about the unit head. Oh, um, no. She's... Oh, yeah, please. Oh, this way. Uh, we were fighting. I, she's got a touch screen computer and I didn't realise and I was trying to get her to do something with a mouse and I was interfering. Um, so there are some uh, data if people go into the uh, risk factors area. Uh, psychosocial risk factors and suicide is an example that the questioner might be interested to, uh, to look at. Um, this is where the ABS have gone through to the original source documents in the National Coronial Information System and gone through and found evidence of some of the psychosocial risk factors that have uh, may have accrued within someone's life. Uh, and we can see just quickly, I've got uh, uh, males here, we've got, you know, personal history of uh, self-harm is, oh, I think Ross is about to pull it up actually, so people can see it, yeah. Um, so these categorizations, um, these Z codes, they're, they're WHO standard um, categorizations. So that's where they came from. Uh, if we, well, we'll pull that up now. Really. Yeah, so yeah, as people can see here with some, um, we've got separation, disruption of family by separation and divorce there. Uh, problems in relationship with spouse or partner, personal history of self-harm. These are fairly similar for what we'll find in uh, the female population, although obviously there's much stronger predictor of a personal history of self-harm here, and that is um, driven in part by uh, uh, females often having a longer history of non-fatal self-harming attempts before uh, they, they do die. Uh, but to have a look at a couple of the other so obviously here's the burden of disease and injury studies. This is one of the ones that I warned people about with the language at the, at the introduction. But if we have a look here, and again, these are these are standard international categories for this type of analysis. Uh, again, we can see the effects of relative effects of exposure to child abuse and neglect, intimate partner violence in the case of um, women here, and then the rest of those exposure factors are almost exclusively around um, misuse um, and and this is a lot I, I told people that we wouldn't do this but I'm go, I'm going there here's the here's the model right where these categories came from was what we were able to link to within the census data so we were really limited by what identification markers there were in the census data they don't collect any of those other issues that we were looking at in the census. We don't collect history of child abuse or history of substance use, but we do collect some of these. And uh, we can have a look at the relative risk that there is associated with some of those um, factors here. And I'll just, as I recall Ros saying at the start of her part of the presentation, there's about your three to one male ratio and about your two to one indigenous ratio. Um, so these categorizations of possible risk factors were simply driven by what we were able to identify within the census data. Um, so I suppose that's a long way of saying it depends. The categorizations that we use the, or analyze on are in a large part driven by what's in the data that we're looking at. Thanks, Chris, and our, our questioner has thanked you for, for that response as well. I always like to finish with a question about the future. So what's next? What are you looking forward to and excited about in, in the system in coming weeks and months? Well, look, at the moment, I'm very excited because I'm uh, working with the Department of Health, my, uh, one of my partner agencies, to um, finalise an extension of the funding to the system so I can assure 
uh, all participants that uh, Ros and I and the team are not going anywhere in the immediate future. We've, we've got jobs for a bit. Um, we're actually moving into a bit of a consolidation phase now, I suppose. There's, um, we've probably compiled and aggregated as much existing administrative data that's readily available around the country as we can. We know there's other pockets of things that we, we can look at. We need to go and talk to um, our police uh, services. We know that there's a lot of examples, particularly in uh, regional or remote Australia where ambulances may not turn up to a self-harming event or a, or a suicide attempt. Um, we don't know what the police data is like. We haven't even started that, but we need to look there. But I think we're getting relatively diminishing returns on a lot of those things. What we do need to do is turn our attention to where the administrative data cannot provide us with information. One of the examples I've already used is around the relative risk of people with uh, who identify within the LGBTQI plus community. We're doing some work with uh, some university researchers particularly to get into that question. And it's not one that can, it's, they're doing stuff through survey data. So it's that kind of thing where we'll now need to start looking at bespoke bits of research or analysis to answer, plug some of those gaps that we can't get out of our larger administrative data set analysis um, and more maps and yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. And we've got some actually, like, thank you Ros, that's great. We've got um, one of our next publications will be a new linked data analysis where the team have been able to look at seven years of deaths for all causes, including deaths by intentional self-harm, uh, and examine patterns of service usage in the year prior to um, persons uh, passing. And what are the relativities between people who are dying by suicide and people who are uh, dying of other causes? Um, I can't tell people what the answer to this is. You have to all trust me, it will be coming out soon. But I think this analysis will actually have significant implications for the way um, our sector thinks about um, in some ways postvention, in some ways aftercare, in some ways how much can we rely on contact points within the health and welfare system to be points of contact with people who are experiencing suicidal distress. Um, and the short answer is um, it's, the, the contact points aren't as large as we thought they were. So we're going to have to think differently about how we provide support to people. If you know, we, we can't just look at the health and welfare system. It certainly sounds like one to look out for. Well, thank you, Chris Roslin and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And indeed, thank you to everyone that's joined us today. We've had a few questions about whether the slides and a recording will be available and uh, Chris and Roslin have kindly agreed to share that. So we'll be in touch after the webinar. We hope you've found today's data and practice webinar helpful and of value and trust you'll be joining us later in the year for the next webinar in this series that will take a closer look at self-harm and suicide attempts data. A reminder to please reach out to a trusted friend, colleague, or one of the support numbers listed in the webinar if you feel you need additional support after today's presentations. Thank you again and have a nice afternoon.